Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the second day. I hope you all had a good night last night and you're not too hungover. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the ESG uh, session. It's going to be quite technical. So, environmental, social, corporate governance is at the very heart of spatial finance. Low ESG ratings scores can occur for weak disclosures and also scandals and controversies that you will find in social media reports and um, newspaper uh, articles. The vast amount of ESG-related data that's available, combined with the complex nature of controversies, requires automation. And this is where artificial intelligence can help. So we have five speakers here, ranging from finance practitioners through to artificial intelligence uh, researchers. And these guys are going to help you understand how artificial intelligence, or specifically natural language processing, can be used to analyze free text, that's unstructured text, for the purpose of ESG um, data analytics. I'm now going to go over to the crib sheet, because our guests are so amazingly accomplished. I can't remember all their um, accomplishments myself. So we'll have Priyank Patra first. He's a director of ESG product management, Morningstar, and is responsible for the creation and execution of a, of a sustainability roadmap for Morningstar's flagship investment analysis solutions. Then we'll have Richard Peterson, who is CEO of Market Psych. Market Psych measures sustainability-related themes, controversies, and concepts in news and social media at scale. Then we'll have Julia Bingler, who, is, or who was a doctoral researcher. She now has a PhD. Uh, she's from the Center of Economic Research at ETH Zurich. Research focuses on climate transition risk metrics and the decision uh, relevance of TCFD-related disclosures. And we're hoping that Julie will be joining the group uh, in the near future. Stefan Zoren is a principal quant at Mann Group's Central Trading Division, where he is responsible for execution of research across all derivatives traded by the company, including futures and foreign exchange. Uh, Stefan also serves as a faculty member and deputy director of the Oxford Mann Institute at this university, where NLP is one of his research topics. Finally, we have Edwin Simpson, who's a lecturer at the University of Bristol, working on natural language processing and interactive machine learning, including topics such as argumentation, summarization, and sequence labeling. And I've collaborated with Edwin now for about 10 years on various projects. So each presenter will present for about uh, 10 minutes, and that will be followed by a panel session. So any questions you have, please hold back until the, the panel session. Thanks so much. So I'll call the, the first speaker, Priyank, to the lectern, who's going to tell us how to navigate the ESG uh, landscape. There you go. Hello. Um, hi. Good morning, everyone. It's, back to, it's great to be back in, in this hall without wearing a white bow tie and a very funny gown. Um, I came in yesterday with a T-shirt and got a few strange looks, so found a shirt and hopefully it looks better. Um, so yeah, my name is Priyank Patwa. I am product director at Morningstar. I, I have a background in computer science and engineering and data has been one of the core things that I've been doing over the last 20 years. So, just quickly going into the content, why, you know, before we even think about ESG, why does it matter, why are people caring about it, I think a lot of this is not news to us, but I'll just give set context quickly. Now, first, I think the customers, every, as an individual, we're all getting much more conscious of what's happening. We are also conscious about what to buy, where to buy, how to look at it. And it's not just climate change, we're thinking about biodiversity, many other topics. That's very great. That's meaning it's coming from the bottom up. Every individual cares about this. Um, the next, I think, company's performance is no more, an this is no more an additional thing for, as a tick box exercise, where you have a CSR report and things are done. I think this is real. If, you, if human capital is not managed in the right way, 
you can see what happens there. This is Buhu in the way they de dealt with the COVID crisis. They dealt with how the employees went through. Um, it was evident what happened next. The next, I think, um, very important probably as well is how the regulatory environment is also starting to shape up. It is still very early days, I would say, but the amount of regulators, yesterday evening there was a panel with all regulators coming from different parts of the world talking about sustainable finance. That's very rare to see five years ago, I think, where every regulator is super focused on sustainable finance, sustainability, climate change, so that's great. However, while you have all of this interest, it still remains not so easy. And that's something that I'm going to touch upon very quickly and watch out for the six Vs. You know, uh, this is the big data machine learning discussion. So we all talk about Vs of five Vs of big data. Here is the six Vs of sustainability that I would quickly touch upon. Um, but before we go there, this is the landscape in which we are operating, meaning it's massively confusing, massively messy, hundreds of data providers, hundreds of standards, hundreds of ways of doing things, super confusing, um, very challenging. On the other side, there is a lot of disclosures coming out, so corporates starting to get very, very aware of uh, these topics, and they're starting to disclose. The amount of disclosures just on climate has just quadrupled over the last few years. However, in that topic, what they are talking about, where they are talking about, how consistently they are talking about, is an interesting question. And then the next interesting part is, as they talk about climate change, as they talk about sustainability, what is the way they are disclosing, what is the way they are talking about? And we monitored about 900 firms, and just the volume of data that they are disclosed, the number of data points, about 12 million data points that they have disclosed over the last 10 years. However, only 25% of this is numeric. So most of this is coming in all shapes and forms, from images, Word documents, PDFs, you name it, it is everywhere. And that means um, the way you, we all did financial reporting, the way we analyzed companies, compared firms, looked at them, needs a very, very different mindset, a different capability set. And that's how, that's the six Vs that I would love to talk about is, you know, the financial reporting is in the middle. Apologies if you can't see the slide, the date, the text, but the, the key part here is uh, in the middle is financial reporting. What we all know about is high volume data. You get P&L ratios, you get cash flows, you get balance sheet data every month, every quarter, every year. It comes very frequently. It has very limited number of metrics that you can use to create a model. They are standard, they are audited, they are numerical, um, and there is a clear definition. Come, now think about sustainability, it's exactly the opposite. It's actually high volume, but massive aggregation effort, massive effort in just putting things together. The velocity is poor. One annual report, one sustainability report, and it's done. Variety, we just talked about the amount of sources and even just think about carbon data. It's so confusing, it's so challenging to just compare and add together the data sets together. Um, the veracity, it's limited audit, audit on these, so we're all almost subject to whatever firms want to say. And, and ultimately, which is probably very close to today's discussion, is it's massively unstructured. Um, and then it is evolving. So while all these challenges are there, I guess, um, and there is a movement to create standards, there is a movement to create regulation and create consistency, that will take a while. So while that is going on, how do we deal with that and how do we get on with the most important thing is address the climate change, address the social governance issues and compare and understand them. And that, that is not going to be easy, but there is a way. So that's where I believe that organizations have to reinvent themselves and have to create these kind of capabilities and teams and people and use kind of newer ways of thinking about this. The, um, the, the same accountants who are doing the financial reporting today, unfortunately, can't do this. 
So you may need to upskill them. You need to change the way things are looked at. And that, that means different skill, uh, ways of doing it. One approach, one example of how we have done it, I will just give a very quick example. Um, am I good with time? Yes. Um, you have sure. okay. three minutes. Brilliant. So, um, so one example here is emissions data. We all talk about emissions being poor when it comes to private firms. It's even, even more challenging. There isn't much data available. Um, and what do you do there if they don't even have the capacity, they don't even have the resources to disclose the data, they don't have that teams? One of the ways we've approached this, and that, of course this is not accurate and this is not perfect, but at least gives a start, is look at the public companies' proxies and come with machine learning models that help us estimate what is the closest possible firm to the sector, to the, to the company, to their revenue, to the number of employees, find those factors that are highly similar, correlated, and helps us at least give a sense of where they are. Of course, there's a lot more we do under the hood. I'm just giving a quick concept. Um, and that, that then, of course, is used by our analyst teams, by our investment teams, who then would validate that and you know, apply a qualitative overlay which I think is another important piece as we address the sustainability space, is the importance of the feedback loop. Whatever we do here is only going to be as good as the qualitative, the human judgment put alongside it, because it's still open to interpretation. And another last example here I will leave with is, I talked about text commentary. Here, some of the NLP techniques have helped us to find whether the companies, while they talk about carbon emissions, do they really talk about something very, very specific? Here is an example of a firm talking about net zero emissions to global operations uh, by certain million tons and talking about methane, etc. So this is far more specific than a comparatively other oil energy firm which is just talking about climate change. So using NLP, you are not only able to find the text, but you're also able to find that relevant context where sustainability is being referenced and with a real target, with something real, and that, that then helps you shortlist or dig further. Um, I'll just, just quickly then run through some uh, more stuff, but I will just end there, is to say, while you do all of this, just one, one quick question, one quick point to think about is, as you bring these things together, you need a way of then simplifying it for a simple end user, an end user who just doesn't care um, of the complexity, they want to know how to bring that. And that's where we create some of the solutions which allow you to take a lot of this data, make it easy, and create some quick searches and find that. So that's sort of one example, but, but happy to discuss more, and I'll hand over to the next team. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. So next we have uh, Richard from uh, Market Psych, who's going to tell us how to monitor corporate risk and returns using AI. Everybody. All right. So I am an engineer and then a psychiatrist by training. And my goal was really to understand how the stories that we tell ourselves impact society at large. So if we tell ourselves a narrative of hope and optimism, maybe that will change society in some way. But if we tell ourselves about catastrophe and danger, maybe that will change our behavior in a more negative way, or maybe not. So what we've done is develop machine learning systems to monitor news, social media, and try to extract what are the stories and the themes that we tell ourselves. And so this, of course, is relevant to today because we're looking also at sustainability themes and specifically controversies, negative commentary about companies, for example, on the news and social media. Here's a very quick example. This is sentiment about Coca-Cola uh, the day that Ronaldo, in fact, the minute-by-minute -minute view, when Ronaldo moved Coca-Cola off of his podium and replaced it with water. So what you see is little by little as it goes through Twitter and people are debating and then the consensus becomes it's very negative over a few hours. And so by monitoring news and social media, you can track the general feeling, um, the feeling tone in this case, of how people perceive Coca-Cola. But you can go much deeper, of course, and track very specific 
elements? How do they perceive the management team at a company? How do they perceive their sustainability efforts? So we can go very deep with this type of monitoring. And the way we do that is with natural language processing. So natural language processing combines elements of machine learning and also human supervision to pull together a view, a digital view of how people perceive the world. But with that digital view, we can then test it. So once we've turned uh, the global perceptions into data feeds, we can run correlations and other predictive models and see, are certain perceptions like Ronaldo moving to Coca-Cola, will that have a tangible impact on Coca-Cola's revenue or sales going forward? Will that lead to more legislation against sugary beverages, for example? So little by little, we can try to track and predict social outcomes from changes and shifts in perceptions. So this is the general idea of turning unstructured data, that is text, and the chatter in social media and news, into digital streams or time series of data that mimic the perceptions or reflect the perceptions that we see in the news media. And here's a quick example of that. We, we ourselves have a pool of about two million sources that we have access to of news and social media, but most of them are uh, usually promoting some point of view or uh, non-objective. So we've sorted that down to about 6,000 sources globally in 13 languages that appear to be objective. And then we run this processing on those sources. Um, we also screen through sources like Twitter, and we find influencers and credible uh, authors on Twitter. And when they make comments, then we include those in our feed as well. And we're able to extract commentary like um, management investigation. I'm sorry about the text there. <laughs> But if there's a management investigation into the company, or if the management team is arrested, any one of 4,000 different themes and topics in the sustainability area, we quantify and we can track. But to analyze those, what we find is we have to often group them into general perceptions. Like, if management is being investigated, uh, then do people trust the management team? Well, well, no, they don't. If the management is arrested or indicted, of course, that's a low trust event for the management team. So we created sort of a general scheme. We have about 100 of these general schemas, like management trust for companies, and we have about 200 for countries, like deforestation and biodiversity loss, things like that. So what I'll be showing today, though, is just some of these correlations. Do things like management trust, the perceptions of the market of the management team, does it actually affect outcomes? Does it affect sales or revenues? And the easiest to look at, in our case, is share prices. Do changes in perceptions affect share prices? So uh, this is just some of the controversies we track. You can see there's a lot of them. There's no need to go into detail on all of these. But what I think is interesting is some of these more notable events. Now, um, in our research, we've found that certain controversies are more impactful on share prices and corporate outcomes than others. Now, that might seem obvious, but accounting controversies tend to be one of the most damaging. Because, of course, if a company is lying about their fundamentals and their balance sheet, um, that reflects poor governance and obviously means that the investors have no idea what they're investing in. Um, here's a view of Wirecard over time. And what you see here in this blue line is the Financial Times first casting into doubt their financial practices, their accounting practices. But it took several years before the company, or it took over a year, before the company themselves actually admitted that they were missing 1.9 billion euros from their balance sheet. Even when KPMG said, well, we can't really say because we don't understand their, their accounting, there still wasn't a big, a big enough collapse in the share price. The company didn't really go away until the company themselves admitted wrongdoing. But what we're trying to do by monitoring the media is look for these signals. You know, most companies in their corporate filings and their press releases won't tell you the bad news. They have every incentive not to. So what we're trying to do is look at the external objective perspective people reporting on the beach from Indonesia. Hey, I'm seeing Danone plastic cups washing up on my beach. This is terrible for, you know, why is there so much plastic pollution from Danone? That type of flag gets flagged on a Danone, and then we say, okay, there's a real problem here with plastic pollution. This company needs to be aware of this. And so by giving them negative scores, it turns out that the scores that we give actually do end up predicting share prices in many cases. And as a result, we can then sell that data into hedge funds and banks who then recalibrate their investments and make the cost of capital much more expensive for companies that are polluting. So the outcome ultimately is by tracking perceptions and reports globally, we can shift investment capital 
and where it goes and which companies are rewarded and which are punished in terms of their ability to finance themselves. So I showed you the accounting controversy chatter about Wirecard. When we look at companies broadly, we do see that those who are said to have questionable accounting or doubts about their accounting practices, they do have lower share price performance. So, and this is a very simple study. We looked at the S&P 500 in the United States. Every month, we would look at the top 10% of companies that are most associated with accounting controversies. That's, again, any kind of questionable accounting practices, even in the top 500 companies in the world, in the, in the United States. And so in a given month, if we rank them and then we track them as a portfolio, we see that over time the, the market is penalizing those companies. Uh, the, every other company, the, the S&P 500, remaining 90% is in the blue line. And the 10% month after month that is found to have accounting controversies or is reported to by the media tends to underperform substantially. So this is how it can impact share prices and how you'll see the world start to splinter, we hope, now that ESG data is available now, there's other types of controversies. There's, a lot, there's many different types, and here's some other interesting ones. Uh, one is here, activist investors. So when there's a lot of activist investor activity at a company, um, most people believe, oh, it unlocks value. But what we see is when it's talked about in the media, it's usually a bad thing. That in fact, again, these are all the S&P 500, the top 10% of companies associated with activist investor activity underperform substantially after they're associated with that activity. So the value is not being unlocked, or maybe the activists are targeting very poorly run companies in the first place. But certainly value is destroyed over time. Uh, regulatory issues, when companies are associated with regulations or getting caught up in government regulations, they also underperform. That's the red line here. Insider dealing, of course, is a bad thing. <laughs> you don't want people um, trading on their own stocks inappropriately. Um, but lastly, and maybe most interesting to, to us, is sustainability controversies. So for a long time, people have said that, um, and I remember this in the late 90s, they said sin stocks outperform. So if you want to beat the market, you should buy gambling and tobacco stocks and firearms because people are not pricing in their actual revenue. Um, and that may have been slightly the case, perhaps, uh, up until about 2014. And there we see this narrative shift. We see the stories that investment managers tell themselves have started to really turn over, where they would be significantly penalized if they were investing in those sin stocks or those associated with climate controversies like oil and gas or, or others. Now, this data here is not adjusted for industry, though uh, we do have data results like this that are adjusted for industry as well. So you see here probably related to the oil price crash, but then subsequently sustainable, unsustainable companies, ones that are being targeted by the media as being unsustainable in their practices, did significantly underperform. And so it does give us some hope that these types of techniques and what you'll learn more about in the session today that um, machine learning applied to understanding the language of the world and how we describe companies, that does give us hope that we can change how people allocate their capital and how companies are rewarded and punished in the markets. Okay. This is a uh, controlled for industry, showing a similar result that um, and it's um, a much more basic result. Just every company associated with any ESG controversy, they do underperform those that are not associated with controversies over time. And similarly, we see a lot of volatility in those com companies. So for investment managers who want to control the volatility of their portfolios are also incentivized, not only because unsustainable or controversial companies underperform, but they have higher volatility and so they should allocate less to those companies. So there's a number of angles by which investment managers are reallocating capital and by which we see the damage in markets. So fundamentally, we see that uh, we see many findings coming out of this type of data. Companies with bad governance, bad management seem to underperform quite a bit. Companies with unhappy employees underperform, and that's a finding most recently uh, here at Oxford. Uh, I think Saeed was the first author found some interesting results there. So we see a number of other controversies here. And I will turn it over now to Stefan, who works in the investment management industry, and maybe, or, oh, I'm sorry, Julia. Sorry, Julia. I'll turn it over to Julia in the letter. So next we have Julia Bingler, who's going to introduce us to Climate Burst. This is a language model for climate-related ESG controversies. Thanks a lot. 
Yeah, so I don't work uh, in the finance sector, asset manager industry or wherever. Uh, I work, used to work at ETH Zurich. I now work on the Council on Economic Policies and I'm about to join the Oxford Sustainable Finance Group. So um, when I started working on TCFD disclosures, that was shortly after the release of the recommendations in 2017. And back in the days, there was a huge uptake of supporters of TCFD disclosures and a lot of um, hope that supporting the TCFD would increase significantly the information to the markets on climate risks and also the information uh, quality on climate-related um, risks and opportunities. So back in the days, um, I was wondering then, but how do you process all this information? It's unstructured data, it's very dispersed across various sources, as we've heard today already. Um, what do we do? And then uh, I got in touch with someone working on natural language processing with uh, bird-based models. So um, in the end, we decided, let's train a model to do that task for us. Let's train a model that's able to classify the information that we want to analyze afterwards uh, into sort of processable pieces. So what we did for the past three years is we labeled data according to the information we want to analyze um, based on whether a certain disclosure text paragraph is climate related, yes or no. That was the easy one. <laughs> then we started with the sentiment, do firms mainly disclose opportunities, um, neutral language, or risks? What we realized with that task was these standard sentiment analysis uh, models, they didn't work at all. So we had to do the thing for ourselves because climate-related opportunities, climate-related risks, uh, as communicated by companies, differ significantly from what we see in general language. So then third, we were interested in Okay, if a company discloses certain information, is that just general like we care about the climate or do they actually disclose what's needed for investors to take information, uh, to, to uh, take decisions? Uh, so we were asking ourselves, can we sort of try the model to extract whether a certain um, disclosure is a commitment and an action or is it just general, yeah, we care about the climate TCFD disclosure style? That was the next task that we were working on. Uh, then we realized, okay, there's a lot of commitments that are not decision useful at all. Um, be it, for example, um, we will reduce our emissions. Okay, what's, what does that mean as an investor? How do I decide uh, whether that's an opportunity to go in, whether that's a risk, how will it change the risk profile of the company for the next five, 10 years? Um, so we said we need to differentiate between specific and non-specific language. Again, we first went to the standard models uh, on vagueness and weasel terms. We realized it doesn't work out at all <laughs> because, for example, if a company discloses we reduce our emissions by standard weasel terms, that would be precise. Um, for us, as taking the investor lens, that's not precise enough to take investment decisions. Also, as a supervisor, as a financial supervisor, that's not enough to understand the risks associated with a certain financial institution for the entire financial system. So you really want to understand what do the companies do, until when, and compared to which baseline. Um, and in addition to that specificity uh, task, we also asked ourselves, okay, since so many um, disclosure standards sort of or, yeah, disclosure frameworks sort of developed into standards based on the TCFD recommendations. Um, do the companies really disclose all the elements that are required to properly understand where they stand, where they want to go, how they're going to do that, how they're going to govern the process or not? So, in addition, we trained a model on detecting whether a certain uh, paragraph belongs to governance, strategy, risk management, or metrics and targets categories. Um, we were especially interested in the risk management and metrics and target categories because we thought that's really the information that you as an investor want to have 
first to price your product for now, but also to get a feeling of the forward-looking risks, and then in the end also how that translates into a strategy. So that's basically how the model looks like now. Um, that's what we did. So we used the bird-based model. I think that's going to be presented later on a bit more in detail. Uh, I just highlight quickly the three main steps that need to be undertaken. So uh, the bird-based models are great because they apply this so-called self-attention, which means that you do not only rely on certain keywords or word embeddings um, that do not take into account the entire context of a paragraph, but the bird-based model is able to take the sentence, split it into tokens, which are parts of words, um, translate that into embeddings, which is basically the numeric form to work on the words as a numeric model, or as a, as a model, like you need the numbers, and then it generates the output. What we did is we used a pre-trained model, um, which is um, a bird-based model, the still Roberta base, uh, we did a domain adaptive pre-training on climate-related text because we realized the information that's in the general language models might be pretty different. Um, for example, mitigation in general language usually relates to general risk mitigation or something. So we wanted the model, the language model, to be able to understand that mitigation could also be part of climate-related words. So we used a lot of news abstracts, reports to do the uh, domain adaptive climate language model pre-training. And then as a third step, we applied the classification layer training with the hand labeled data um, on the classes presented uh, on the first slide. So that's basically the third step, the classification. Um, there's a lot of keyword-based approaches out there to uh, understand or to extract climate-related data from text. Um, obviously, like we, we wanted to understand, is our model really better than the ones that we see out there? Uh, not only in terms of the tasks it performs, but also compared to general tasks that we see. Uh, and um, when comparing the F1 score, which is sort of the performance score of the model, uh, with keyword-based approaches, uh, we mapped the climate bird performance against the amount of keywords you could feed into uh, for training a model. We see that for climate, yes, no, it's, it has an increased F1 score, but it's not too large. So the reason is that this, <laughs> those charts are a bit um, badly displayed because we, we started 0.86 um, uh, on, the, on the climate, yes, no, and um, for the sentiment, for example, we started 0.5, so be careful about the numbers. Um, but then we see also for the sentiment analysis already, the keyword bridge, the approach is were significantly worse, and also if in, but also if increasing the number of keywords, their performance uh, increased a lot. Um, on the specificity of the language, we saw that keyword-based approaches were pretty bad, or like worse, the more keywords we identified as being related to specific content. And uh, on the commitments, it was a bit similar. So what What's the key learning here? It is the more complex the task, the more complex your model should be able to extract the information, not necessarily based on keywords, but try to apply context-based models. Um, based on the data that we extracted, we then constructed a cheap talk index. So what do we mean by cheap talk? It's basically the share of commitments that are non-specific um, over the total amount of commitments. I added two examples here, um, and I have just one minute left, so that's why uh, I think you all could think of non-specific commitments yourself. <laughs> and um, I show you how we applied the climate bird then in two examples. Um, we use it to visualize, a, uh, visualize um, whether there's more cheap talk across the various uh, TCFD categories, for example, in the energy sector or in the financial sector, and how that evolved over time between 2010 and 2020. Uh, this time dimension is key because um, if you assume that disclosure is going to be better over time, you need to assess, like, okay, but what's the baseline? 
Also, we assessed whether being part of the Climate Action 100 plus uh, targeted companies, so not the ones doing the engagement, but the targeted ones, uh, setting a science-based target or supporting the TCFDs associated with more or less cheap talk. What we see is that supporting the TCFD is associated significantly with more cheap talk, um, and science-based targets doesn't have a statistically significant impact. And Climate Action 100 Plus actually is the only initiative of those trees that seems to reduce this cheap talk. So the take-home messages for you today are the quality of labeled data is much more important than the quantity. That's one of our learnings. Uh, we see uh, keyword burst approach are considerably outperformed the more complex the task. Um, the climate board itself, it's a useful tool for analysis and also for supervision. So be it as a financial analyst, be it as an investor, but for the supervision also for policy makers. And still, there's no such thing as automated ESG management. So we still need all of you and uh, reflect on the results, uh, start to engage with the companies and try to implement useful climate mitigation and adaptation activities. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Julia. That was great. Thanks. So now we have Stefan, who's going to tell us all about the topics in NLP and ESG that he is researching on in the Oxford Man Institute. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, here we go. So, um, yes, my name is Stefan Zorin, and um, my role here, I actually have two roles. I work at the University of Oxford here as an associate professor. My background is more in machine learning, so I'm in engineering science, and we do a lot of work on machine learning and finance in general at the Oxford Mann Institute for Quantitative Finance, and I also work at the Oxford Internet Institute where I teach as a Master of Social Data Science. But then, besides those academic efforts, I also work commercially with Mann Group, which is a big asset manager which actually funds the Oxford Mann Institute, and I will be telling you today a little bit about those two sides of the story. So the one side is the academic research here at the university, as well as some of the commercial work and how can we maybe use some of this academic research in uh, practice. So uh, first a little bit about the Oxford Mann uh, Institute, which is the academic institute here at the university, which was founded in 2007. We have a wide range of research in machine learning and finance, anything from portfolio construction, reinforcement enforcement learning, risk management, and other areas. But then also, especially more recently, we have been quite active and interested in areas of natural language processing and networks in finance. And I think those are the areas which are especially interesting for, for this topic here of machine learning and ESG. We have seen a couple of examples already, and we did some interesting work there on financial news modeling, where we basically look at uh, kind of financial news and we extract company relationships by reading the news and then construct networks of how companies are related to each other. And we can do this between companies but also between companies in certain sectors or keywords and see uh, those connections. And in this paper we actually look how sentiment propagates through these networks from one company to the other, which is quite interesting. We did it in a more general setting, but you can also do this kind of for specific sentiments on specific uh, topics there. So that's something quite interesting. We also use uh, do research on financial word embeddings and language models. That's something more uh, like what Julia has been uh, doing, as well as some analysis on kind of social social media data, maybe a bit what, what Richard has been doing, and I've just highlighted one research there on where we actually look at kind of uh, Reddit posts and try to forecast COVID-19 caseloads from that, which was quite interesting work, and it's actually interesting to see how we built a model which integrates the natural language processing side of things with the time series. So it, it both has time series information as well as uh, news information or social media information. I think there's a quite a lot of potential by kind of merging those two things because you can get a lot of information just by from the time series by just trying to forecast caseloads from yesterday and a week ago, but then also you have all this other information. And I think the key idea is to kind of not use them separately but integrate the time series with the natural language uh, data. And we also have a 
interesting interpretabilities there. So we can look at different, different regions in the US and can actually see which words are actually related or the model relates with increases in COVID and not, and we can kind of interesting see the kind of role of former presidents of the US on increasing and decreasing uh, COVID caseload. So that's quite interesting to see and get some understanding of how, uh, how those models actually uh, learn those uh, relationships there. Now, on the commercial side, uh, obviously, Man Group is a big asset management company. It has a lot of work, especially in the ESG area. I just focus on three topics here, which are more related to, to machine learning. And I will just show you uh, three slides on those examples. One is kind of measuring climate change uh, news, and also how can we actually make sense of potentially different research and different news providers and, and see how can we potentially integrate them, then prevalence of ESG topics, and then something else also on, on climate uh, modeling. So the first thing was just kind of uh, what about climate change uh, news? So there are different ways how you can go about it. I just wanted to say, obviously, if, if you work on a commercial site, there's so much uh, kind of offerings these days on, on, on getting this information, you might actually want to have a look of how those compare. And so this is just a kind of uh, simple example. So if you wanted a kind of quick and dirty approach, you can just use something like uh, Google Trend, which is very universal, and just see kind of how do kind of climate change related news um, kind of trend for different companies and try to extract some, some time series here, which you can see in this kind of green line here, uh, evolving over time for one example. Then you can also go about and just read up on the most recent academic research. You can try to get kind of coded up and try it out yourself on, uh, on how that kind of influences uh, climate news for a different company. Or another thing is you can go to a third party provider and kind of buy a product which is effectively some signal on uh, climate news for different companies which you could try to use for risk modeling or for prediction tasks to size your investment positions, and here was just one example of how actually, uh, for, for some cases, those three actually uh, look quite alike. You can see the, uh, the, uh, the third data provider and the actual academic research are quite similar, so it might just be that the third party provider actually coded up the same academic research. And that's quite interesting for you to know because there's the wealth of information and a lot of data providers, so it's, it's good for you to kind of understand how do those actually relate and potentially if there is some orthogonal information, how could you potentially fuse all those sources of information and that's where a lot of um, statistical techniques come in, especially Bayesian machine learning, which is what our last speaker will be talking about, is quite important once, to, once you want to kind of combine those sources of information. Another topic I just wanted to mention quickly is just looking at earnings scores, for example, and see the prevalence of certain ESG topics and especially how they have been, just showing how they have been rising here over recent years, which you can which you can extract from the data, and that's obviously quite important. Uh, we heard it with the talk on cheap, uh, cheap talks that kind of people just throw in those words, and it's also quite important because it shows us how non-stationarity our environment is, and that's something quite important uh, if you apply machine learning techniques to just be aware of that in finance things are generally non-stationary, and you really have to be able to deal with these changes here, just the fact that people just throw in many more of these keywords more recently, so you have somehow have to make your models adaptive to this, otherwise the models which you trained for five years ago won't be working anymore so well. So this is just something to highlight that non-stationarity is a big uh, piece. Now finally, so we heard a lot about natural language processing, we heard about, a lot about networks. I also wanted to quickly mention that you can also use other techniques like from image recognition. This is some work done by Matt Goldklang, who's a climate scientist at Man Group, and, and he uses this uh, super resolution CNNs, which is a method of uh, statistical downsampling there for climate data. That's quite interesting, actually, because, I mean, if you know how those climate models work, if you want to kind of simulate the climate environment, you basically kind of take your atmosphere and you slice it up into different hypercubes, and then you run physical simulations of the kind of physical equations which governs the, the climate. The problem is that those, to do that efficiently of the whole planet, you can't chop those hypercubes up too small. So they're very large, and if you look here, for example, Oxford would be in the same cube as London, and there would be 
kind of measured with the same temperature. But in some cases, uh, you would really like to drill down how is the climate changing in different cities. And it can be quite drastic if you're at a coast in the mountains, climate can change quite a lot. And this is where these techniques of statistical downsampling come in. The interesting aspect is that some of the more traditional techniques actually they can't very well deal with extremes. So such a heat wave like we had this week, it would have been washed out in this downsampling techniques. And this is where these deep learning techniques are quite good. So you take this, this coarse-grained climate models and you complement it with some finer-grained data on uh, elevations as well as some other measurements like rainfall on a local basis. And you then train the model to kind of give you very location-specific climate information, which then you can apply to company locations, for example, factory locations, and, and you can use that to, to try to figure out how those companies might be affected by climate change in the future. So this is something what people also are interested in. And with that, I leave it with this uh, important fine print here where you also need a super resolution network to be able to read this. And I pass on to the last speaker, so thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Sorry. Right, so the final speaker is Edwin. He is going to um, tell us how to deal with small amounts of training data in NLP and on trusted data too. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Edwin. I'm from uh, the University of Bristol, and I'm quite new to ESG, but um, our group is interested in uh, working on applications uh, where we have limited and untrusted data and trying to make NLP systems that work in these real world problems. <clears throat> so what I mean by limited and untrusted data, we've, we've got text sources that we'd like to process and we're not sure how reliable those are. But these uh, machine learning methods that we need to use to do NLP also depend on large quantities of training data. So these are examples of the input text and the outputs that you want to produce from your systems. Um, so what we need to be able to deal with is situations where we don't have those huge amounts of uh, labeled reliable training data. Um, so what we'd like to do is produce robust predictions in those situations. So the first line here is showing you an example of what we might want to do. So we've got some uh, document that describes uh, something about the ESG commitments of a company. And we'd like to be able to uh, analyze this text automatically and ex extract that span that's underlined there in purple that says the commitment of the company to, to a, some particular ESG target. And perhaps also the italic orange colored bit reached our target, which is telling us the current status of, of that commitment. So how far have they got with it? Um, and we can get quite a long way with some fairly now well-established NLP methods based around models like BERT. So these are pre-trained models, which means you've, the companies that have developed them, such as Google or OpenAI, have collected enormous amounts of training data. For example, the whole of Wikipedia, a whole bunch of books, and a lot of data just scraped off the web. And these models can be trained in such a way that they learn to map raw text to um, to numerical representations. And that allows us to then do some really uh, to, to do the machine learning processing of that text that we'd like to do. So we can apply mathematical operations to these numbers, essentially, and get the predictions at, out the end, such as which of these words in this sentence belong to the uh, commitment and which words are not part of the commitment. Um, so what we normally need to do is take this pre-trained model that knows something about language and adapt it to this specific task of, of identifying those commitments by having some examples of, of these sentences with the, the correct annotations. But this is a, a quite an expensive task to do, getting hold of this training data. Um, so we've, we've got a whole bunch of techniques that we can use that we've been working on in our research group to try and adapt these models to this sort of situation. So, for example, we want to make sure that the model doesn't um, o doesn't overconfidently make predictions based on small amounts of training data. So Bayesian techniques can help us to deal with that uh, by, by providing better calibrated probabilities that are more, more meaningful. We can introduce contrastive learning, which helps us to train the model to separate that underlined purple text from the black text. So it's going to learn these numerical representations that better distinguish the different categories of text in our data sets. 
And we can try and improve the robustness of the predictions to changes in the text by using adversarial training. So this is a problem that comes up in some of these large models that we can change uh, one word there, like changing the word reduce to decrease, and you'll find that you get a different prediction at the end. And of course, that's a meaningless change to, to us, but the model uh, doesn't, doesn't know about that. So we, we have all these techniques that we need to use, uh, and that can help us to produce more useful classifications when we have uh, small amounts of training data. But there might even be situations where we don't have training data at all, and this is not actually the end of the world. We can still apply NLP techniques here. So for example, if you consider a task where we'd like to categorize different types of uh, different ESG statements, uh, such as the, the text on the right. Um, so we, what we do is to take that text and then we append uh, a prompt to the end of it. So this can be something like uh, a template with a missing word in it. So we, we've got this whole block of text now which starts with that statement we want to categorize and then we have a prompt which has got a, a missing word in and our pre-trained BERT model is going to try to predict that missing word. And it's already been trained in its pre-training phase to do that so we can get a classifier that can reasonably guess which of the different categories is most likely to, to be uh, the word to fill in this gap. So it might be an environmental commitment. Um, that BERT model can be better adapted to this specific task by us finding some training data from somewhere. So we don't have real training data, perhaps, but we can scrape uh, data from the web. Uh, and do something called distant supervision. So this is where we look at uh, different sources that define the different categories that we're looking for, like this environmental category. Uh, and we can train the model then to better recognize that kind of text. Now, in other situations, we might uh, not have training data, but we do have an expert user who knows something about this task. So we have somebody who knows how to do this categorization or labeling task. Uh, and we'd like to get that information from this expert user. I guess it could be some, somebody like you in the audience. Um, so domain experts. And again, we can use these pre-trained BERT models to do this. So they have uh, the possibility to compare two different sentences to each other. Um, so for example, the user on, in this example is uh, explaining why they think this should be uh, classified as an environmental commitment. And uh, what the BERT model is going to do is compare those two sentences together and see if the second one follows from the first one. So if the explanation follows, then that piece of information, knowing that this explanation follows from this piece of text, helps the BERT classifier to decide this is an environmental commitment. Uh, as a counterexample, you've got some statement that talks about money laundering instead. Um, and. Uh, if you compare that to this statement, the company plans to reduce its carbon footprint, then we can see that doesn't follow. And so the BERT model knows that this is perhaps less likely to be an environmental commitment or it has some clue about um, how to, to categorize it. Okay, so I've talked quite a bit about the, uh, the way we get uh, deal with lack of training data and get expert information into the system. But in some cases, we're dealing with unreliable sources of text themselves. So we can collect information about a company and what it's doing from different sources. We heard a lot about that, about that earlier in the earlier talks. Um, so for example, from different news reports on social media and so on. And we can run NLP classifiers, like sentiment classifiers, for example, to tell us uh, what the sentiment is from each of these different reports. And so we've got some unreliable reports and we've got classifiers that add another source of errors to, to our data. So what we need to do is find a way to aggregate all of this information about a specific company. Uh, and we can do this using uh, Bayesian approaches. So you can see in the diagram, there's a, a method in the diamond box at the bottom called IBCC, which we can use to learn how to do this aggregation step. Um, so this is a kind of Bayesian combination method the goal is to predict the true label. So for example, predicting the sentiment label uh, for a particular company at a, a particular point in time by combining multiple labels. So we've got classified uh, news sources and, and these, each of these sources provides us a label. And as we add more of these labels uh, into our aggregates, 
even just taking something simple like a majority vote, as you add more sources, you're going to get an increase in accuracy. With the Bayesian approach, what we try to do is learn the labeling biases uh, and the error rates of each of these sources. So there may be some sources which are always overly positive and other uh, classifiers that you've applied that are perhaps particularly noisy, and we need to take that into account. If we use this Bayesian combination technique, you can get uh, much more uh, quickly with fewer label sources to high levels of accuracy. So really, the takeaway from that part is uh, if you need to distill reliable labels from multiple unreliable sources, you can use Bayesian combination methods. And we have a whole uh, bunch of software that you can actually use to do that at the moment. So this is one of the techniques that we can, we can help you to uh, find new applications for uh, straight away. So I'm going to end there. And yeah, OK. Thanks so much, Edwin. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Wow, what uh, amazing speakers we had. Positive smorgasbord of, of everything in there. Who said ESG was easy? It certainly is not. I don't think anybody said ESG is easy, actually. But the dimensionality, when you think about bringing sort of biodiversity into the mix in, in E as well as uh, climate change, it's all just going to blow up. So just a, a few take-home things here that, that I've scribbled down. You know, the connection between the ESG problem, uh, the controversy problem, and machine learning. We've got issues to do with heterogeneous data, data both qualitative and quantitative and the six Vs, it can be you know, a lot of data, small amount of data, there's generally a small amount of data when you're dealing with sustainability. We've got methods here that allow you to, to actually work with small amounts of data and as Edwin said, the Bayesian approach is, is important to, to regulate the, the um, conclusions. Um, methods to do with adversarial training, amazingly useful, if you just tweak a sentence a little bit, expect the, the meaning to stay the same. If the meaning actually changes in terms of the, the classifier, then, then there's an issue there. Uh, it's part of the, the, the training process. Uh, time series analysis. That's where we can uh, track individuals' perceptions and the, and the influence they have on share prices, performance, volatility of, of companies, and so on and so forth. Uh, a few talks on BERT, which is, the, which is the main sort of natural language processing model now goes further from the old uh, uh, words of VEC methods where you can now take context into account and really get a, an under, you know, the machine can understand the meaning of the, of, of the sentences and do a lot more with that. Uh, Julia did say though that uh, AI is not a panacea, we do still need the human in the loop, which is definitely the case right now. Perhaps in the future though, the, the human might be superfluous. But that's, that's the state of play uh, right now. Uh, NLP is just, just one tool that we have. There's network analysis, connections. That's something that obviously relevant to supply chain analysis. Um, vision, science-based evidence, all these things can be fused together to give us an idea of what the company is, is up to and therefore what ESG score should be assigned uh, to them. And non-stationarity is also uh, very important, that the conclusion that we drew a week ago may not apply right now, and tracking uh, sentiment and tracking uh, ESG is something that's, that's critical for investors. So, once again, can we please give the... Um, presenters, a round of applause, and then we'll move into a uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Um, do we have Shivani here? Ah, thanks, Shivani. Okay, so um, any questions, please? Okay, so we have the chap over there in pink, I think he is. We'll take two, and then the woman here in green. Um, hi, Carl Mallon from XDI. Um, it's really interesting watching how you're essentially taking uh, essentially one set of data, mainly public domain disclosure, and then trying to apply numerical learning to try and essentially create something which is comparative. And, and we do supply data on physical risks to folks like Morningstar and Sustainalytics. What I'm interested in is, I'm thinking, well, we have a data set on 15,000 companies around physical risk. We often know more than those companies know about themselves. Is there an opportunity for us collaborating to try to essentially create data sets that you could use to teach 
um, um, these systems? And in a way, are we all heading towards something where we're trying to overcome greenwash in ESG? And are there ethical issues in that type of collaboration? Right. Yeah, I think uh, l just spending the last one and a half day here, or close to that, uh, that's a big re uh, constant realization that's there is how much the industry can collaborate with the universities. Um, that's, in fact, what we were d discussing last evening as well over dinner is how much collaboration could make a big difference. I think the biggest challenge there is uh, the motivations and the f focus areas and trying to get there in, a, in one, f one rhythm would be interesting. And I think that is one of the topics that is close to everyone is climate change. So starting with something specific, making it open source, making it accessible, and then allowing the research to work together. I think that's what we were talking about, co-creation, because this is not where somebody can just leave the data and say, now, go figure out a solution. It's how we can co-create. Uh, definitely, there is an opportunity there, and definitely, there's a lot of work going on, but more to do. <laughs> yes. well, I can also add something, I think, just from the, our perspective as the Oxford Mining Institute and academic institution, there's always a, a difficulty for us with the kind of budget of an academic institution. How can we compete with all those kind of asset managers who can purchase all this data? And, and we want to do machine learning and data, but we need data. And often it is, it is a limitation for us, and we are constantly kind of negotiating discounts for data with Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, which have very expensive subscription, and getting them on the academic side is quite difficult. So it's something interesting where I think we see more and more collaborations between different data providers engaging with academic institutions where for us it's good to have more data and sometimes also for the other party it's good to have some more studies which kind of sh find or showcase further kind of evidence that, that this data uh, has predictive power. So I mean from our perspective we're always looking for uh, more relationships with kind of alternative data providers on the academic side and I think it's also interesting even for publicly available data like something on I did, Wall Street Bats, that's not always so easily uh, accessible as a kind of structures data. So we've been also looking into actually kind of scraping this data and, and kind of creating and hosting benchmark data sets, where it's not just a data set which is more structured, but also coming along with a benchmark data set. Okay, he, this is a task which you can do on this data. This is what our results are. Please go ahead and do better. That's something we are trying to do as well, which I think is quite encouraging. Think about what is the data source one could use and how can we maybe create a benchmark on that, which we can then hand out to the academic community to work on. Because in image recognition, in natural language processing, we have very typical benchmark data sets which you see at every conference, but we, we don't have that necessarily for finance, so it's really good to look into those examples. Maybe from uh, past experience, I would add some points. So, um, training the climate bird, we reached out to many commercial data providers, asking them whether they had already sort of pre-labeled data from the analysts. Um, what we heard back was mostly, yes, we do, but if we collaborate with you, we wanted an exclusive access to the model. That doesn't work for us as academics. <laughs> that also didn't work for us with our general core mission to provide a model that's applicable by many parties, stakeholders, whoever it was. So that was a core issue when training the climate bird. In the end, we did it all ourselves. Um, also because we realized that even if we got some of the data sets, for example, we also worked with the CDP data, which, is, which, was like, which we bought in the end. Um, we, we've seen that it still doesn't fit pretty well the very precise tasks that we needed it for. So that was one side of collaborating. The other side was um, b 
Beyond that project, I had another large project comparing various transition climate risk metric providers. And there the collaboration was great. So people had an interest in sort of understanding their own models better by us having a look at them. And by us being able to understand or to, to derive comparability criteria and assess uh, how peers would probably perform, we had the information, we didn't disclose the, the sensitive stuff, but we disclosed the results, and there people were very interested in understanding better where they stand. So that was, I think it depends a lot on the, on the type of collaboration, but it also depends a lot on the sort of whether you want to go for a business case, that could be difficult. Okay, thank you. Um, the woman in green, please. Shivani, it was a well, third, third row occupied. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Oh, my name is Nikki. I'm from an NGO in Amsterdam. Um, I have a question for Richard, but maybe others too. Um, you mentioned that uh, certain controversies um, lead to damage to the company, and that especially sustainability in EG, uh, ESG controversies um, are sort of becoming more damaging. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about um, is there any difference between like human rights violations or emissions or other kinds of differences within the sustainability because that's very broad um, and also is there some idea about um, how long that damage lasts is that like two days until the company says sorry or is that a lasting impact yeah this is a great question so we do see of course diverse re responses by the markets and we actually see different responses by countries as well so human rights violations, for example, we do see that impact, for example, Chinese companies quite a bit. Um, but in India, in the Indian subcontinent, we actually don't see a response in the markets from human rights violations. So there's different markets, I think, have attended different issues. And um, we, uh, what was another example you had? Um, so human rights violations or, oh, emissions, yeah. So in, in Japan, for example, we see they're very sensitive to carbon emissions. So carbon emissions increases do seem to lead to stock price underperformance. Um, yeah, and so we see a variety like that, and I could, it's a long list of what works in different places. Um, what, and of course, markets change as well. The, the cultural narrative will change over time, and so some countries will no longer be rewarding you know, sinful companies, and they'll change. What we saw in the United States was uh, deceptive advertising, which was often Facebook, Google, companies, you know, tech companies. Uh, they were rewarded. For, you know, those who are high in deceptive advertising were actually performing better in their share prices. So sometimes we see these anti-ESG effects as well. Um, and in that case, you know, we didn't control for industry because it's really only a very limited type of company that can do advertising in the first place. So there's a lot of um, factors like that and there's a lot of conditions that we have to control for. And so it can be very difficult to parse it all out. And so we tend to look for what are the big long-term global effects. And that's what I was trying to show here. Many of them, unfortunately, go back to the balance sheet and accounting. Um, but carbon emissions, more and more, we are seeing that globally. Another thing we saw in China was corporate uh, sustainability reporting. Companies that do the reporting in China, they do get rewarded with their share prices going higher. So in some countries, that is rewarded. In some countries, it's not. But hopefully, that'll happen more and more over time. Great question. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Where are we now? Um, I think the person at the back put his hand up first, but then we'll go with you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, Jacob Tome from Two Degrees Investing Initiative. Um, kind of shocked, to be honest, that CDP is selling data for academic purposes, but that's probably not the right question to ask here. <laughs> um, I want to ask the uh, panelists talking about the assessment of the quality of the talk, right? This talk is cheap notion. Um, the engines are obviously quite powerful, but I'd be really keen to hear a little bit more about what you think really the end applications are of this engine. So where do you see this driving change and what kind of change do you think it will drive? Do you think this will be something that will be more interesting for risk users, let's call them that, or more interesting for sustainability users? trying to see, look at the quality of targets and whether such engines then can really replace that manual work of digesting the information that uh, we heard is also part of the process. Thank you. I would like to start with the impact. <laughs> so on the cheap, like we released our first paper on that back 
I think two years, two years ago, and uh, it was taken up by the Bundesbank and refined their position on mandatory versus voluntary disclosures. So they said, okay, if we see that most of the information does not really, like, on voluntary basis commitments, does not really enhance the, inf the decision useful information in the markets, we need to act. So that was one of the impacts we've seen. Um, using this tool basically as, a, as just an analysis of the state of the art. So this being said, uh, for individual investors or decision makers um, interested in risk versus sustainability, I think those tools, or the climate board at least, helps you to extract the information you might be interested in, but then you still need to check, okay, um, in this entire document of unstructured text, what do I find? Do I find, um, for example, more important information, and how do I process that and feed that into my financial model? So this is not automated. You still need the person who judges in the end. Um, so I think what it does, it supports and sort of yeah, streamlines some of the processing of the information but it does not necessarily lead to certain outcomes. It very much depends on what you use it for. And uh, we see that many financial supervisors are very interested in the model to see and assess how their regulation is actually being taken up. So whether, for example, mandatory TCFD disclosures um, are providing the information they want to see in the markets, that's a supervisory task, right? So that's nothing that an individual investor would be interested in. Um, just quickly add on on that. That it's also this is also seen as an opportunity. It's um, and I'll give you one specific example. Uh, when we were doing something similar using NLP, we started seeing companies in an oil and gas sector far more advanced in their thinking, like thinking about methane, not just talking about carbon emissions. And they are almost pricing in that risk and thinking about it far ahead of the time, which is invariably going to come out from the regulator at some point. So identifying those firms that are ahead of the game, thinking before time is sort of an opportunity, and that's how one of the applications. And a similar one is you know, CDP data, where we saw where there is data available on whether there is people on the board responsible for climate change and thinking about it. So there is a deep conviction there, and hence likelihood that there would be a, a decent opportunity going forward. So it's, it could be seen from both a risk and an opportunity perspective. Shivani, person in the front, please. And then Thank you. Um, thank you very much for great presentations. Uh, my name is Natalia. I'm uh, from Queen Mary, University of London. I have a question uh, to Julia mostly, but if anyone have comments, please <laughs> uh, also answer that. I will be really grateful. So um, this relates to the different structure of the text in different industry sectors. So we've been doing very similar analysis to what you are doing, but it's a slightly different topic. And when you actually capture the text from one industry and try to compare it to an, another industry, there will be absolutely different contexts. They use different words, but they talk about different things, like word embeddings fail if you tr try to get uh, labeling in one corpus and then go to another corpus. You will have different labeling across all the corpora. So um, how did you address this problem and any recommendations from any other speaker? Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, definitely an issue. So um, how we address that was um, <clears throat> when, when extracting the data, we were careful of having balanced industry representation. So um, we extracted data from all the industries, like from 11, the 11 core GIX uh, industries. Um, then when labeling, we were careful to have examples of each of the industries in each of the labels. So in the end, what we see is that the the wording, as you said, is very, very different, but as long as you do train the model on sufficiently high-quality labeled data across the industry wording, it, like to us, it worked. Like, then you get 
significant, like, then you get reasonable outputs. Just use it as an input, what you want to apply it to. So, I mean, all these domain shift issues, they definitely, like, I wouldn't apply that to, I don't know, extract whether information in a certain news outlet or whatever is meaningful or not, and just trust the model blindly. I, I think the more complex the task gets, the more domain-specific you need to do the training. Can you speak to what industry you're looking at? Okay. Or, or which topic specifically? So I'm working on AI transparency account accountability when we're talking about applications of AI to sustainability. So it's, okay. it's a, a little bit more narrow, but w when you look into different sectors, they, people mean very different things, right. speaking about the same. And essentially for us, um, we cannot reach enough size of the label data, mm -hmm. not to cover like half of the corpus. And I see, I notice that you have a relatively mo modest label, number of labels. I mean, it took us three years to get yeah. to this <laughs> amount of label data that was really quality enough to inform the model on what we wanted to see. Okay, there, yeah. there is no magic, maybe some <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, automated, uh, automated, <laughs> automated methods you can suggest. I guess in some cases you could do industry specific fine tuning. We had models where the base model has to be trained over a larger universe, but then you can fine tune just final bits of the model for different different sectors there, which at least helps you with the scarcity of data. Yeah, so wait, where you've got these labels that are, well, different labels from different industries, you can still treat them as uh, weakly informative of the set of labels that you want to find. So you've got one set of labels, that, there's probably some overlaps, and some of them are giving you clues about the labels you want to predict. And in those cases, you can use techniques like these Bayesian combination methods to learn from those, those labels from the other industries <clears throat> that give you some information about the ones you're trying to predict. Um, and then, yeah, I think also, as uh, Stefan was saying, the, the sort of transfer learning approach, where you, the, the base of these models, like using BERT or uh, some other kind of pre-trained model, is trained in an unsupervised way. So if you've got a huge amount of the, uh, the unlabeled text data, you can also take advantage of that to adapt the model. Yes, you can find... So, so you can adapt the, 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 the basic embeddings of the text can be adapted without really knowing anything about the, the text domain. You need that collection of text. Um, and then to learn how to predict the labels, you, you, can, uh, you, you probably do benefit a lot from having a, at least a small set of examples from, of the labels you, you want to predict, your target labels for each of these different industry domains. Um, yeah, just if I can add, I think this, um, we've not used a lot of ESG acronym, so, but I will throw in one, is the SASB materiality map. I mean, there is one that has, it gives you a lot of very granular sector level detail of what topics matter by every sector or within subsectors. And that is one of the ways we use to classify or train some of the uh, text we labeled. And I think the next, la last piece I would say is whatever AI we talk about here, the feedback loop is critical, so the context in which oil and gas operates versus a technology sector operates is very different, and hence having that sectoral input somewhere is going to make your model far more relevant than intelligent only. That's what I think setting up the framework for your in you know, each industry and what's relevant for each industry is going to be one of the biggest tasks. It's actually setting it up and binning the articles and the relevance for each one. So it's a, it's a big task. Yeah. Right, I think we've got time for two more questions. So I'll take the person over there and the person up against the wall towards the back. Thank you. Ariel Babcock at Folks Seeking Capital on the long term. We're a Boston-based think tank. Um, so just following on Jacob's question, I, I think this panel is actually really depressed me and hopefully I don't bring, bring everyone down with this question. So if Julie is finding that TCFD is not giving us decision relevant information, right, it's predominantly non-specific and not investor decision relevant, 
and the regulators are all moving towards TCFD as their standard framework for disclosure. Um, so putting that alongside what I think I'm hearing from this group, which is that these AI and NLP models are highly sensitive to misspecification. So there's lots of room for error in the categorizing of this data. Like, what do we need to improve this situation? Since I don't think we're going to get it from regulatory disclosure if that disclosure relies on TCFD, which we know is nonspecific. So if that's the right interpretation of, of the conversation I'm hearing here, how do we get to solving this problem? Um, good yeah, luck, guys. Uh, <laughs> you, go for it, Julia. Okay. I have to take four times more, uh, <laughs> <laughs> four times more is, um, time speaking for, mm -hmm. for the gender balance, so that's why I go first. <laughs> um, so, yes and no. So, usually the regulatory frameworks build on the disclosure framework itself from the DC, TCFD, but they specify individual elements to be disclosed. And um, what we did also based on this research and also based on the other transition re risk metrics research is that we de developed precise templates of which information needs to be disclosed to be decision relevant, to be useful for investors, to be comparable. This information, in order to be processed in the end then by automated extraction techniques, could be easily just enhanced with this XBRL standard. Then you develop an XBRL taxonomy, which is not a EU taxonomy, <laughs> um, to extract exactly the data points you need for comparability. So what we find is if you stick with this frameworks without standardization of A, the accounting, so accounting frameworks need accounting standardization, but also disclosure frameworks need disclosure standardization. And um, we need, like, where we stand right now is that we have some accounting frameworks, some disclosure frameworks. The push for standardization, I think, helps. And I think you also need auditors. So if we have yes. the accounting, yeah. we need auditors. Same with the climate. That's going to be probably third-party firms like um, you've represented. So there will be others who come in and look at that. But until there's a teeth to that, you're right. It's not going to be very valid. But eventually there probably will be requirements around auditing. Last person. Back there against the wall. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anna Irmisch, European Climate Foundation. Thanks so much for this panel. Um, I have many more questions, but I stand in the way towards the break. So I keep it <laughs> short and I will focus on uh, two items. Uh, one was, uh, there was a slide about SFDR Article 8 and 9 disclosure. So if I would be a customer, would I be able to see the source of the assumption when I go in that? So I would be just interested in not the sales pitch, but also what do you struggle with in terms of feeding me what I need if I want to comply and if I want to find out. And um, when I rely on your data sets as a user, that would be interesting for me to understand, like how do you improve specifically this part? Um, and the second question I was having was on how do you define investor activism when you do a sentiment analysis because um, when I analyzed shareholder proposals uh, in the blue chips um, in the US, so it was not necessarily a correlation I would find in terms of is it the amount of shareholder proposals on a certain topic, mm. is it an anti-ESG or an ESG uh, advocacy proposal, so um, I'm just keen to understand because um, active ownership also means engagement and not just AGM activism, so those are the two I would be happy to get answers to. Thanks. I can take the second, or go ahead. Please go. Uh, on, on the second question, we just, we classified it as any references to typically activist investors, which um, when it's classified, refers often to takeover, investors engaged in takeovers or trying to refine the operations of a company. So uh, often it has not historically meant sustainability related activists. That's become more common in the last, say, two or three years in the United States, but most of that data set was not related to 
sustainability? Yeah, I think on the, if I understood the question, uh, you were looking at how, um, let me, I'll try and quickly address that, is one of the things that all the ratings or data that is there is, is a form and opinion is not an answer. And that is something we all probably have to be cognizant of, is this is to simplify, help individuals to start. It's not the end. And that's one of the challenges we have is mm, with the myth of credit rating that this is an answer. The same is not probably yet true about sustainability is you will get a, a, a starting point of opinion. What also happens with that is you also get more information alongside. So you have, for example, a fund rated X, Y, Z, or five or four, you also would want to demand, and it's possible to get which are those companies within those driving that rating. And then what are those companies that are driving that rating positive or negative? What are they doing? How much are they exposed to animal testing, for example, or whatever factors you care about? And that's possible and that's available. And I think that's whatever source, whatever we use, that is highly recommendable that then you can form your own, you can apply some judgment on it. But treating them as answers could be slightly challenging because they are not, as, as you mentioned, they are not yet audited, they are not yet regulated, they are not yet accurate. But that's my, that's, what, the way of, uh, we would look at it, and same applies to Article 8 SFDR, is a view and a, a interpretation. It's not the answer, and that shouldn't be how I would say we treat that. Helps. Happy to take more, but yeah. Yeah. Right, we're done? Right, I think coffee and cake await. So one more round of applause for the presenters, please. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.